Now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get in our Father's Word. I'll tell you what, this uh, book of Mark is a fantastic book. It moves rather rapidly through the uh, Gospels uh, that are written by Matthew and uh, Luke and John, but through the eyes of a very young person, a teenager more or less, and uh, what a memory he had, and what a, what a report uh, in the sense that it does move along. Chapter 9, verse 14, a word of wisdom in the book of Mark, word of wisdom from our Father, and uh, it reads, And when he came to his disciples, uh, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. I mean, kind of uh, got a little thing going on here. 15, and straightway. Immediately, all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. It's very possible, uh, because of this very sentence, I have to think that just coming from the Mount of Transfiguration, as Moses still had a part of the glow, the glory, the Shekinah glory about him from having come there, that perhaps Christ did too. And it's obvious they were very, very impressed, um, and they saluted him. Verse 16, and he asked the scribes, what questions ye with them? Question, what, what, what was your problem? What were you asking them? And one of 17, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And, of course, this is reported again in Matthew uh, 17, I believe it is, that, uh, and I'll refer to that a time or two as we're explaining this. Luke, uh, Mark, rather, he does shorten things down a bit. That's fine. 18. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out. And they could not. And uh, this, is, this is something that uh, is rather a deep thought into casting out evil spirits. Now, as you would find in Matthew, this, this child is moonstruck. It, he, is, it is a, he is a lunatic, as it is reported there, which means moonstruck. Luna from lunar. This is why when the moon is full, that evil spirits like to, to um, uh, impress upon people their presence. Oft times, not there's, again, I, no one should ever worry that there's one behind every bush. There isn't. And Christians should know what to do about it if one should come their way. But uh, that's, that's what is the problem here. This is probably because it is lunar and he is moonstruck. It's probably uh, the evil spirit of Satan himself that inhabits this one. 19. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? He's planning now to know that he's going to be crucified. He's not going to be walking the earth to help them always, but he will be present, spiritually speaking. And how long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Bring him over here. They had tried, and, and uh, no doubt this evil spirit was laughing at them. Verse 20, And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, immediately the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. I mean, this is, this is a brave rascal because he knows Christ and he knows who Christ is. 21, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. He's had it all his life. Verse 22, and oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Don't, don't ever think an evil spirit's going to try to do anybody any favors 
or fall in love with who they're with. They hate, they hate mankind. <clears throat> now listen carefully. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, now let those words pass through your mind. That, that old if is always a big question. And now you tell me, what do you think about this person's faith? If you can help us, would you? That won't cut it with our Savior, friend. You've got to know and believe and know he's a can-do type Savior. He can do what he wants to. You might say, well, <clears throat> his disciples have tried and they failed. You can understand how this one person might have a little doubt. Well, it's true, and maybe this is why that Christ will give him just cut him just a little bit of slack. But listen to the listen how it goes down. Verse twenty three. Jesus said unto him, "If there we go, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth." I mean, not just a few. If you think this demon is salty. All things are possible to one that believes, if you believe. In other words, Christ is warning him. You have to believe upon me or I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going there. And, um, and so it was. Well, let's, let's observe 24. And straightway, let's just say immediately, the father of the child cried out. And he said with tears, Lord. I believe, not if, I believe, uh, help thou mine unbelief. That's a wonderful prayer. And, and um, that's, uh, as I said, if he cuts him any slack, it would be that, and it's fair to ask for help on unbelief. <clears throat> I oftentimes say you're either a believer or you're not. There's no halfway believers. You either have faith or you don't. But it is obvious this one is crying out for help. He's been, this thing has been around him. He's been around his boy. He's wallowed him around, ruined their lives. And he's begging for help now. Verse 25, And Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked the foul spirit saying unto him, Thou dumb, deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. That was the word of Jesus Christ himself. What happened then? 26. And the spirit cried and rid him sore all the way, friend. But he had no choice and came out of him. And he was as one dead insomuch that many said he is dead. He was wore out, exhausted, totally, completely exhausted, 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose, 28. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, not, not publicly, privately, why could not we cast him out? Why couldn't we do it? And then naturally playing back onto Matthew chapter 17, verse 15, he, it, he was a lunatic. He was moonstruck. And no doubt it was from Satan himself. Uh, the reason belief and the ifs leading up to this, Christ was even teaching then, hey, when you're dealing with Satan himself, there can be no ifs. There can be no maybes. You either do or you don't. If you have the power and the authority to order Satan around and out. But we know from Luke chapter 10 verses 8, 19 forward, we have power over all of our enemies if we believe and have the faith to know through Christ's name and his help, we can cut it. We can do it. That was the lesson, my friend. And they're asking, why? 
What does he answer? 31. And, um, and let's see. I'm sorry, I guess I missed the verse. What verse have we got next there? 29. And he said unto them, This kind, meaning lunatic, moonstruck, can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, there is a deep lesson here, and you must learn it. What, what is the difference between feast and fast? A feast, you feast on food. A fast, you refrain, stay away from food. We have had two miraculous feedings of 5,000 and 4,000, and we picked up fragments, and you better know how to fast to stay away from the crumbs. You better well know. If you're going to, if you're going to be able to cast out demonics, you better know how to separate yourself from wood bees to the real thing. You had better know what is the doctrine that is of Christ and the doctrine that is of men. There's no ifs, ands, or maybes. You better, and this is a lesson for his disciples, you better stay focused. You pray to the Father and thank him for the privilege of serving him and for the power and authority to execute the order when it is asked in his name, but at the same time, you had better be fasting from the traditions of men and the words of men, the fragments of their, every time you get in a large crowd, you're going to have some nutcases there. You've always got to weed them out, get rid of them, because they make nervous the flow of the Holy Spirit, and you better be able to cut it, friend or God just won't be able to use you. God wants you to stick with the simplicity. Stay focused. Feast on the Word of God, but fast from lies, deception, fragments of men's traditions that make void and upset the flow of God's Word whereby He, is, he will not work. That's quite frankly, this is a good lesson to those disciples that were present and picked up those baskets. Did you hear what that old boy said as they passed by? Wasn't that something? It's a bunch of malarkey. If it differs from the Word of God, it's a bunch of malarkey, okay? You, that's one thing as a Christian you must learn is to fast when it comes to listening to garbage, well, or you mean just bad words? No, I mean people supposedly holy Joes. Supposedly well learned in what though? Traditions of men. Not the scripture, not the word of God. And quite frankly, well, what does that amount to? Well, when it comes to really lifting the load, that's to say ridding yourself of Satan's evil spirit, they can't cut it. Not even the disciples under that influence could cut it. They couldn't do it. And they come crying to the Lord Jesus Christ saying, why, why couldn't we? Why couldn't we do that? How, how, how long would he have to go through warning them about the doctrine of the scribes? You see... Prayer and fasting from ill-reputed words builds faith and power and authority. And you're able to become a can-do type person. God can use you then. Verse 30 to continue. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. Why wouldn't he want people to know? Because he's... He knows we're approaching that time and he wants to teach the disciples privately that he's going to die on the cross. He doesn't want them to have too many surprises where they can't handle it. So it, it, this will be a personal teaching to his followers, preparing them, if you would, his disciples, for 
uh, his departure. Verse 31, and for he taught his disciples. For that reason, he wanted to teach them personally and said unto them, the son of man is delivered into the hands of men and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Period. There it is laid out that simple. Naturally, the last time this happened, Peter said, I were not, no way we're not going to let this happen. And Christ scolded him, said, get behind me, Satan. You know, he, he, th this time they were, they did not uh, like this saying, 32, but they understood not that saying. As simple as it is, they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him most likely because of what happened to Peter the last time. But I, I want to make a, an extra point here as to why you should focus on God's Word because He never lets anything slip up on us. He never lets anything surprise us if you'll just listen to Him and stay focused on His Word. Then you can understand and not be dismayed in the way that um, times and places, events and things happen. For he has foretold us all things as it is written. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that verse here, but not too many chapters hence, where he uh, promises us that he has foretold us all things. The real question is, have you learned? Have you listened? Have you read? Okay, well, next verse, we go with verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, the city of Nahum, consolation. And being in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? Now, now he knew. He, he knows what we're thinking, but here they're kind of got a little conversation going back here. And they're not letting him hear it, they thought. Verse 34, and they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Which one of us do you think is going to be the greatest in heaven? Now, that, that doesn't set real well with Christ. Do you want me to tell you why? Let me just tell you why coming out the gate. Do, do you love your heavenly father? Do you have any, any doubt in your mind that he is the greatest? And compared to him, what we are? Then don't ever ask that question. What do you think about the Lord Jesus Christ that sits at the right hand of God? And do you want to know who's the greatest? I would say get behind me, Satan. They held their peace because they were kind of ashamed of what they were talking about. Verse 35, and he sat down and he called the 12. This was his teaching them. And he saith unto them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. This, Jesus wanted them to know that lesson. He that is greatest in the service of Almighty God becomes the servant to all that listen. This is why Christ himself, who was the greatest, washed the feet of the other 12. He didn't have the other 12 wash his feet. In the first place, the lesson of foot washing would have gone by the wayside and many people would have been deceived and think, I need to get my feet washed. Well, we do. You, you, you should wash your feet occasionally. But what was Christ talking about? It's that when you walk on this earth, especially in sandals, you're going to get your feet dirty as you live in these flesh bodies. You're going to sin, in other words. But only Christ and Christ only can cleanse you through repentance. Only He can wash you clean, white as snow. So he becomes the servant 
of all, and he is the greatest. What a lesson. What an humbling thought and respect and love that should go from your heart out to him as he is gently teaching them about the service to the king. Verse 35, and he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he sent him to them. He picks this child up and holds that child close. And 35, whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I want to tell you something about a child. When a child respects an adult, they will ask a thousand questions. Their, their mind is just searching for what is right and wrong. And if you are their parent, whatever you say, they're going to believe. There are no ifs, ands, or maybes. They are wide-eyed, and they're asking questions as a youth, filling their minds with truth. What Christ said, we kind of have to become a little bit like that to receive the kingdom. We have to listen to Christ, the teacher, and accept every word as truth, as fact, and build their own in that regard, okay? And he said, anyone that, and you know, uh, there are people that are quite along in age that are just babes in Christ and must be handled likewise, 38. And John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he followed not us and we forbade him because he followed not us. I want you to underline in your Bible the word us. Did he say, he didn't follow you, Lord? No, he didn't say that. John said, he didn't follow us. Well, man's not necessarily supposed to follow man. Man is supposed to follow the Savior. Man is supposed to follow God. And God knows what is in the man's heart as to whether he should really receive leverage against the enemy. Uh, by that I mean whether he's a fake or whether he's a real thing. And if he follows God rather than us, then God will know whether to bless him or not, won't he? Got the picture? Now let's go with it. Verse 39, but Jesus said, forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly or easily speak evil of me. Well, that's common sense. Which is simply saying, if the man asks the miracle in my name and I grant it, it's myself that does it. And he can't very well go around doing good works and have uh, evil uh, running out of the same stream or mouth. Verse 40, for he that is not against us is on our part. Why? You, you want to remember and, and insert the thought in your mind or you're going to get lost in this chapter. It means we're one body. We're one body serving God. If, if they're really genuinely doing it in his name and are following the simplicity of his teachings, there is only one body, and there certainly you're, the body cannot be against itself and be successful. You understand? Now for the rest, 41. And whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ. Verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And actually, one should never take advantage of this to receive a gift, certainly, or something of that nature. But at the same time, who is the living water? What kind of water is it that you should share? 
the living water, which is to say Christ. And who is Christ? The, the Word of God. The living Word. To share it. To be able to discuss it. Whereby both are edified. It's a beautiful thing. 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, that's one that truly believes, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. Well, what would happen to him there? He'd drown. He'd be dead. What he's saying is, if you offend one of these little ones, I will know it and I will see that uh, certainly that uh, things are taken care of and set right. Okay. Verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now, I told you back in verse 40 that you got to think of it as one body. If, and, and every little church and every little group makes up a part of the body, okay, that carries forth the Word of God. This is not God telling you to harm your body. What it's telling you, if there is a group over here that say is playing the part of the hand and they're teaching fragmented trash, then get rid of them. Don't associate with them. Cut yourself off from them because it's better to cut that group off than it is the whole body to go to hell. Okay? That's... Never in the world would God want you to harm your own body. We're speaking spiritual here. And that's why back in that 40th verse, I drew it to your attention and declared you must think in the terms of one body. Where, where is this that the fire cannot be quenched? Well, let's go to the next verse and we'll find out. Verse 44. Were there worm, I'm sorry, um, it's better having two hands into hell than, uh, I, I want to say one more word about this 43rd verse. Hell, of course, is Gehenna. And you, you must understand, what is Gehenna? Well, it's, it's the valley outside of Jerusalem, and that's where the garbage pit is. And it burns night and day, smolders, and they throw dead animals on it. All right? Now verse 44. And where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now, this will be repeated a time or two. Uh, what's the worm? It's a, well, let's be real. It's a maggot. Okay? And the maggot, when they throw the old bodies on there, the flies blow the carcass, and maggots uh, are formed there. And they partake of it, and it's, it's a, a description of what hell would be like, all right, only in a spiritual sense, 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be, than having two feet to be cast into hell, Gehenna, okay, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Um, if, if you have a part of the church that care, you know, a foot usually is the traveling part. It's better to cut it off, cut, cut off the group that is practicing garbage. Don't have anything to do with them. I, I'm going to tell you something, my friend. This is very serious. And this is many times why you will have church splits. It's usually for a good reason. And, um, and it's probably difficult. Some say, well, Christians can't have trouble getting along. Well, in cases, if somebody starts listening to garbage, it's time for a split. Because it does terrific harm to the whole body. Well, how could it do terrific harm to the whole body? Because a leader is supposed to extricate that that is not fit. That that would harm one of the little ones. You must get rid of it. 
but it's not talking about harming your physical body. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. Verse 46, for their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. On and on it goes, all right? Uh, some believe this is a copyist error, be that as it may. One more time, and uh, it sure belonged there. 47, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and to be cast into hell, Gehenna, for uh, as fire. Um, and um, all that teach, Christ is, um, uh, should be teaching that Christ is part of the body as well. Now, the eye is the seer. A seer is usually a prophet, so to speak. If somebody begins to bring, if there's one of a group over here that begins to bring in false prophecy, cut it off. It doesn't mean to harm your own eye. That's stupidity. God uh, tells us to value our bodies, for within dwells the soul that serves God. And God, Christ used Gehenna as a, a picture, if you would, of, of hell, um, so that uh, as to what the burning lake of fire in the very end would be. Verse, um, next verse up, uh, verse 48. Where their worm, the maggot, dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Uh, now, when, when does the maggot quit? Well, when the food stuff is all gone, the little maggot turns into a fly and comes directly to your table where you eat. So you want to nip stuff in the bud and get rid of it, whereby in that it doesn't harm the little one spoken of back in verse 36. You have to protect the tender ears. You have to protect the little ones. You know, many people study and they say, I want depth, depth, depth. Well, friend, we have new people that are listening every day. Don't you love them? Don't you, don't you have patience or time for them that just come into the truth? Or, or must you be all by yourself? That's deep. Ooh, deep what? Deep stuff deep where the flies are. Folk, you, you listen, focus on God's Word in the simplicity that Christ taught or you are in trouble, bad trouble. Gehenna has been placed before you as a warning and to separate yourself from fragmentation. Fragmentation meaning that that is a, only a fragment of truth and a bunch of lies otherwise or, or deception. Think about it. Keep yourself pure. Hey, we'll pick it up here in the next lecture. Don't you miss it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?